How you going guys and welcome to another video. This video could be your first video on your IB chemistry journey, so thanks for dropping in. Hope you enjoy the channel. Now let's get straight into it. This is 1.1, the first topic of IB chemistry, introduction to matter and chemical change. Let's go. So topic 1.1, introduction to matter and chemical change. We look at atoms and mixtures and we review chemical formulas. The IB understandings are that we need to have an understanding of atoms and how they combine in fixed ratios to form compounds. We need to discuss what a mixture is and that they're either homogeneous or heterogeneous. And then we look at being able to write some chemical formulas. So first off, what is an atom? An atom is the chemical elements found on the periodic table. Those are what represent the atoms. Each chemical is made up of a different type of atom. And the thing that differentiates the atoms are the electrons, the protons, and the neutrons. So the different numbers of those differentiate the different atoms. Now, very few elements exist in their elemental form on Earth. That's because they've already undergone a reaction. So they're found as compounds that have formed or joined with something else. So a compound is two or more atoms that are combined with a chemical bond. So they're stuck together, they're physically bonded together. Now, if we look at some of the different substances that we might find, and then we have a look at the atoms present, then we can go to classifying them as elements or compounds. So if we were to go out into the middle of Australia and dig up a lump of gold, that would have just gold atoms. So that's an element, it's elemental gold. It's the only thing present in that sample. So it only has one type of atom. If we have something like carbon dioxide, which is something that we breathe out, well that contains carbon and oxygen, and the formula is CO2. Now because that's got two different types of atoms, that is classified as a compound. Sodium chloride, NaCl, that contains again two different types of atoms, table salt, so that would be a compound as well, or classified as a compound. Now nitrogen gas, nitrogen gas has the formula N2. Now that consists of only nitrogen atoms. So even though there's two of them, it is only nitrogen atoms, so it is elemental nitrogen. So what is a compound? And you need to know the definition of a compound. A compound is formed when two or more elements react to form a chemical compound. Compounds contain a fixed proportion of elements and are held together by chemical bonds. In topic four, we look at the different types of bonding and those different types of bonding could be metallic, ionic, or covalent. The properties of the compound differ significantly from the properties of the element. So the compound is very different to its individual elements. A great example is sodium chloride, which is table salt. So table salt is made out of sodium, a group one metal that is highly reactive. It reacts with water, it reacts with the air. And it's also made from chlorine gas, Cl2, which again is a very toxic gas, has been used as chemical weapons in the past. And it's kind of this green color, which you can see on the slide here. Now those two elements, they combine to, to form NaCl, which is something that we sprinkle on our food. Now, if we have a look at some of the physical properties of both sodium, chlorine, and then sodium chloride, we can see that there is a lot of difference in their physical properties. So here we have something that has a melting point of negative 101.5 degrees. Now that must be the gas. It's got a very low melting point, so that's our chlorine. Something with a melting point of 98, well, that's our, that's our metal. Our sodium is described as a soft metal, so it has a pretty low melting point. Whereas sodium chloride, it actually has quite a high melting point, 1413 degrees. It's a strong compound. It's a solid and it's hard to break. Now the chemical reactivity of chlorine is very high. It wants to react with everything. Sodium is also very high, but then sodium chloride, it's very low. It's fairly unreactive. The only real thing you could get it to do is to react with electricity if you pass electricity through some water. The little gif that I've got going on there shows how we've got chlorine and sodium in a volumetric flask, and then on the addition of some water, we have a very violent reaction to form sodium chloride. So what is a mixture? 
Well, a mixture is composed of two or more substances in which no chemical combination has occurred. So it's a mixture of two different compounds that are moving in between each other, but they're not physically bonded together. A mixture is, so air is a mixture of gases because it contains a whole bunch of different compounds that are not chemically combined. They're all moving between each other. So we've got a whole bunch of nitrogen in the air, we've got a whole bunch of oxygen in the air, we've got some methane from the cow farts, and then we've got also some neon and a few other gases. But it's a uniform distribution. We can't see the different compounds, so it's a mixture, and it's known as a homogeneous mixture. So air is an example of a homogeneous mixture, meaning it has a uniform composition. So the composition is the same throughout. If we have a look at a heterogeneous mixture, that's something like oil and water. It doesn't have a uniform composition and its properties are different in the different sections of the mixture. And it's also possible to see the different components of a heterogeneous mixture, but not a homogeneous mixture. Okay, a little bit of year 10 review. We need to be able to write chemical formulas. They are important throughout the course. And we can use the periodic table to determine the number of valence electrons or the charge to work out the formula of an ionic compound. So remember that we have the groups which are the, hot, the vertical columns of the periodic table and then the periods which are the horizontal rows. And remember that the groups give us information about how many electrons are in the outer shell. Now that is important information because we can use that to work out the charge. So something in group one has one electron in the outer shell. So it will form a plus or one plus charged ion. So when lithium loses one electron, it becomes a one plus ion. Things in group two, well they have two electrons in the outer shell. They will form two plus ions. The big bit in the center is the transition metals and they can be a little bit funny. They're known as transition because their charges can change. That's called oxidation number and that comes up in topic number nine. But for the transition metals, you'll sometimes be given a Roman numeral which indicates the charge. There are a few others though that you just have to know. So their charge varies which is why they're called transition. So for example, a couple that you need to know is zinc. Zinc is always two plus. Silver, silver comes up quite often, it's always one plus. And then we have a few others that have a variable oxidation state, or sorry, nickel has two plus as well. And then some with some varium, varying oxidation states are iron. It has could be a two plus or a three plus, and they'll tell you that using Roman numerals. If we now move over to the right hand side of the periodic table, we can see the staircase which separates the metals on the left and the non-metals on the right. So everything to the left of the staircase is a metal, which forms a positively charged ion, and everything to the right of the staircase is a non-metal, so it will form a negatively charged ion. So in group 13, we have aluminium, which is a metal. So Imagine just removing the 10 and having the three. So aluminium has three electrons in its outer shell, so it will form a three plus charged ion. If we move all the way over to group 18, group 18 would have eight electrons in its outer shell. It's a noble gas, so it won't want to react with anything, so it's zero charge. Group 17, they want to gain one electron, so they become one minus. Group 16, they want to gain two, so they become two minus, and group 15 want to gain three, so they become three minus. So we can use the periodic table to help us identify the charges very quickly. There's quite a few others that you'll need to know. Ask your teacher to see the electrovalency table for the polyatomic ions that you'd need to remember. A few are coming up on this slide. So if we're asked to write ionic formulas, we need to write something that contains a positively charged ion, a cation, and something that contains a negatively charged ion, an anion. Now many of the anions are called polyatomic. That's because they contain more than one element in their formula. Poly meaning more than one. So some of the polyatomic ions you need to know are nitrate, for example. Nitrate has one N and three O's, but its charge is just one negative. So the compound consists of a nitrogen and three oxygens, that's its formula, and its charge is just one minus, so a singly charged anion. 
Sulfate is SO4 2 minus and carbonate is CO3 2 minus. These are three that you really need to know, but there's a whole list of other ones as well. So if we're asked to write the formula, so we need to write the formula for calcium hydroxide. Calcium is in group two, so it's a two plus ion. Hydroxide is another polyatomic you need to know, that is OH minus. Now when I go to combine these, I have a problem with the hydroxides. Because it's only minus one charge, it needs another minus to balance out the positive charge on the calcium. So I need two of them. Now when I have two of a polyatomic ion, I need to use the brackets to indicate that I need two of the whole thing. I need two OHs. I can't write this as OH2 because that would mean I only have two hydrogens. I need two of the whole thing. So if I've got a polyatomic ion and I have to have more than one of it, I need to use the brackets to indicate I need that many of the whole thing. Copper 2 nitrate, the little Roman numeral for 2 indicates the charge, so it's Cu2+. Nitrate is a polyatomic, which is NO3-1-, and I have the same problem here. The nitrate doesn't balance out the charge on the copper, so I need another nitrate. Because I need another nitrate, I need to use the brackets to indicate that I need two of the nitrate ions. The last one, aluminium carbonate. Aluminium is a 3 plus ion and carbonate is a 2 minus ion. Now these two don't go nicely together, but there's a couple little tricks. You could look for the common factor, which is 6. So I'd need two aluminiums and three carbonates to make the 6. Or we can do this little trick where we just swap the charges over to give us Al2 and then CO3, 3. So we have the formula by just swapping the charges over. That's a little bit of a trick. Okay, topic 1.1, some top tips. Remember the descriptions about homogeneous and heterogeneous and know the definitions of a compound. Thanks for watching guys, don't forget, drop a like on the video, subscribe for more, and I'll see you next time.